everybody. This is Heather Riggs from the New England Museum Association. I want to welcome you to this afternoon's workshop with Carol Ann Penny. As we were talking earlier, she's going to be like the NEMA official coach here. <laughs> so I thought that's pretty cool. Um, she has spoken quite a bit at a lunch with NEMA conferences. She's popped in on other events. Um, she's awesome. I can't say anymore. So I do appreciate the New England Yeps for um, coming up with this program and inviting Carol Ann today. So I'm not going to say that much on this one. Today is being recorded and will be available just in case you have to pop off a little bit earlier. But I will turn it over to Marie, one of our YEP PAG chairs, to tell you a little bit more about that PAG. Hi everyone, my name is Marie Palladino and I'm a YEP co-chair. Um, and I just want to welcome you all again to this session. We're really excited to get started in just a moment. Before we do, I just want to introduce myself and hope, hope that you, and express that I hope that you will all come to other YEP events. We do YEP events once a month and if we have time at the end we'll tell you a little bit more about that. I'm also, um, I just want to introduce my co-chairs. Uh, where are you? Lisa Evans um, and Emma. Where are you? Yes, yeah, so you guys could quickly introduce yourselves and say hi if you want. Hi everyone, as Marie said, I'm Lisa <laughs> Evans. Uh, I live uh, in Vermont and I am currently the Associate Director for Collections and Programming at the St. Albans Museum. Emma? Hi everyone, I am Emma. I'm the third co-chair for the YEP PAG group and I'm so excited to have you all here today. Um, and I work in education at the American Independence Museum. Excellent. And again, my name is Marie and I work at the Mary Baker Eddy Library and I'm the head of educational programs. Um, however, I do want to kick it over uh, to a dear colleague friend, Carol Ann Penny of Penny Leadership. Um, I'm going to let her tell you about herself, um, but you guys should all be excited because she has a lot to share with you. Carol Ann, take it away. Alrighty, thanks so much, Marie, and to the Yeps and to Nima for having me here today. Yeah, we were joking that when do I get to officially call myself the the coach of Nima? Um, I love working with museum professionals, and I'll tell you a little bit why. Um, let me see. Let me get my screen share going here. And you guys know how to use the reaction button, so you can give me a thumbs up if you can see this all fine. Yes, awesome. Okay, so um, I'm so happy to be here. My name is Carol Ann and I am a strategic career coach and the founder of Penny Leadership. My mission is to help you navigate your career and your leadership with purpose and resilience. And so what that means is moving on this crazy career, shifting terrain with a sense of focus, a, a clear sense of what kind of impact you wanna have, but also adaptability to the changes that inevitably, inevitably come our way. And gosh, we learned a lot about that in this past year. Um, I work specifically on career and leadership development, and I've been a certified professional coach for eight years. Um, I work with people at all different stages in their careers, but I find that there are a lot of executive coaches out there, and I'm here for everyone else, for emerging and mid-level professionals, um, because there's a lot to navigate out there, and I like to think of myself kind of as a travel agent for career navigation. Um, I started my career in museums at the Providence Children's Museum and went on from there to be a nonprofit leader in the arts and culture sector in Rhode Island. And so while I work with people in all different industries, this is where I feel most at home because I feel like museum people and arts and culture professionals are really my people. So I'm so excited to be here with you today and excited to see that we've got people from across the country. So welcome. Um, I love a, a lively chat. Please um, type your reactions, your questions, your aha moments, um, anything. Uh, want to keep that really lively as we go throughout this session. So I want to share with you that as I've been working with people from a, across a lot of sectors and professions, I've picked up on how the rules have changed about how work works. And yet our expectations have stayed the same. 
And it's really, really important for us to change the way that we see our career paths in order to match the current reality. Because otherwise, we feel like we're always striving, never arriving, um, always failing, always reaching for that thing that is just elusive. And as I talk you through each of these, I want you to think about how maybe you've held on to these old beliefs and how you might adopt some new beliefs that will help you change your approach to your career and to start feel like the leader of your own path. So the first um, shift that I've noticed is that it used to be the case that you choose a career like it's a mountain to climb over the course of your lifetime. So you choose that mountain and, and for a lot of you that mountain is museums. And so over the course of your career, you're going to climb up that mountain. Maybe it's in the education department, maybe it's in collections um, or development. And so what happens when you're climbing up that mountain and all of a sudden you realize, oh crap, I don't wanna be on this mountain anymore. That's when people start to freak out and they start to look around and say, oh my God, do I have to go over there and start at the bottom? What other mountain am I gonna like better? Do I have to go back and get a new degree in order to uh, start something new? And I find that this approach is not only completely untrue now, it's totally unhelpful. And so I wanna propose that we think about this a little bit differently. I'm gonna take off my presentation so I can just look at y'all. Um, so I wanna think about it differently. Instead, the way that work works now is that you create your own career path. So let's throw out that mountain entirely and think about instead ourselves in the driver's seat of a Jeep. And it's like off-roading. You are creating your own path. You don't just choose one road to get on and go over the course of your lifetime. You're going to be changing, um, changing your path a lot throughout it. So I want to ask you, if you were to guess, what do you think the average number of times is that people change their jobs in their lifetime? Go ahead and put it in the chat. What's your guess? How many times do you think the average person changes jobs in their lifetime? 27, 8, 10, 6, 7, 115, <laughs> 8, 15. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's more than four. It's, it's 7 to 12. And I even wonder if that number is outdated. That's something that the Department of Labor and Statistics of Department of Labor and Statistics um, released. And I think that that number might be a little dated. And the important thing to, to note with it is that it's not just jobs, it's actually careers. And so that means there's change is a part of your career path. And there's a lot of freedom in that. It means that you can turn on to a new road and um, explore new things. Your interests can change over the course of your career. There's a lot of responsibility in that too. When my mom graduated from high school, she was told she could be three things, a nurse, a secretary, or a teacher. And she chose to be a nurse, which she was for over 40 years. Well, my daughter, who's five, she's going to have 11 billion options of what job she might have, what career she might choose. She'll probably have more than one job at a time. She'll probably have many careers in her lifetime. And that's a lot of options and a lot of um, choice to cull through. So it can be quite overwhelming at the same time as being freeing. The thing that I like to think about since we're not just picking a path like nursing, for instance, to not just think about the what, the job title or the industry that you're going to be in, so museum educator, but instead think about what the deeper connections might be in your career path. So it might be about why you do what you do or how you do what you do, or maybe who you work with. And those things, even though you have these varied jobs and different turns over the course of your career, 
you um, have common threads that connect all that you do because it all comes from you. The second outdated belief that really goes along with this mountain analogy is that your career is going to grow in that linear path, forward and up. And I can't tell you how many people I work with come to me and say, well, I don't really have a linear career path. Um, and the, everybody says that. I hardly know anyone who has had a linear career path. Um, if you're worried about a lack of upward growth opportunities in an advancement where you are, will you raise your hand? I want to see. Yes. How many people? I've heard a lot this week as I've been talking to folks. There's no opportunity for upward advancement. I've grown as much as I can here. There aren't positions available. I'm falling behind. I'm stuck. Where's the ladder that I can climb? And this is something I've been thinking about a lot because if that linear trajectory is, is the case, if we're all wanting to climb that ladder, then are we all headed to be executive directors? Is that the trajectory that we're all on? Because I don't want to be an executive director. It's, it's not for everyone. You know, it's, it's, it's a specific type of work that some people really excel at, but some of us want to be in education. Some of us want to be doing programs. Some of us want to be doing development. And so how can we grow even when we top out in the positions um, that are available to us? And the way that I've shifted my thinking around this is instead of thinking about your career as this linear path, think of it as a portfolio of work. And so as you're in that Jeep, you're kind of having an experience over here and that, and that comes into your portfolio. And then you take this road over here and that comes into your portfolio. There's more than just forward and up. There's over here, there's over there. Sometimes you can loop back integrate something new or rediscover an old skill set um, and apply it in a new way. In museums right now, I think we're seeing, we could look at what's happening right now and say, there's a dead end. Maybe that's because the museums are closed. There's a lack of um, employment opportunities right now. But even before the pandemic, a lot of the leadership roles are taken, right? And a lot of you are coming up through these organizations with a lot of heart, a lot of skill, a lot of passion, and the leadership positions or the roles that you're looking for are just not open. And so I, I'm thinking that might, there might be another way of looking at this. Um, and the way that I'm thinking about it is taking your museum skill set and bringing it into some interesting other spaces. At first, when the pandemic hit, I was worried about how we're going to lose so much talent in the museum industry and in the arts and culture profession, because a lot of my clients were thinking about jumping ship, finding opportunities elsewhere. But the more I think about it, the more I think that's actually kind of neat, because we can infuse the world with museum methodologies. You know, we can get out there and infiltrate. <laughs> and find some new ways to bring your skill set and the methodologies that you use in museum settings into other places to get them thinking with the kind of openness, inquiry, curiosity, connection that is what we're all about in this industry. And so that's a possible way to shift your mindset around how you can grow in your career. It's not necessarily that unless you're moving forward and up, you're falling behind. It's that you can take these other roads and create this portfolio of work and it only contributes to the richness of your career. But the only way that's going to work is if you tune into the connections between things rather than thinking that you know, you're hitting dead ends and you're going off course. And I think any two things can be connected if we, if we tune into it. So that's the second one. You are going to move in all directions to develop your portfolio of work. The third one is the myth that there is this one perfect job for you. So I have a lot of clients right now who are looking for jobs, as I'm sure many of you are. 
and they're really stressed about getting this next move right. You know, they, they've, they've found jobs before that weren't the right job. And so they want to find that dream job that's got it all, that's a really good fit for them, that's totally in alignment. And there's a lot of fear of choosing the wrong um, opportunity. But really, the truth is that there's no one right job for you. There are many jobs that are opportunities for you to share your skills and have a meaningful impact. And for many, many of us, that means often having more than one job at a time. There's, I've talked with a lot of clients who want to find this all in one job. I think that's sort of this, this uh, mindset that we have that success is having one job where you can fully express yourself, where you can really use your skills, where you can grow and get all of your income and benefits. And that's, that's the whole foundation of your life. But as I work with more people, we contain multitudes. You know, we have a lot of different interests or different parts of us that want to be expressed. And so for many of us, that's not going to come in just one job. Um, it's going to come through the work that we do, but also the volunteer work that we're a part of, or um, a side gig that you have, or a community that uh, you have a role in. And so when we look for ourselves to fully be professionally expressed in one role, then we are, um, that's a lot to put on one role. Instead, I want you to think of being in the driver's seat of curating your own mix of work to express yourself professionally. I'm going to be leading a workshop on that um, in, a, in a few weeks with a friend of mine who's an arts, arts and culture professional um, who we have put together this workshop on um, resilient career navigation for underemployed arts and culture professionals. You may, uh, you may be one, you may know them. Um, here's the link to that, um, that workshop. I wish I had tons of time to dive into some more ideas about how to piece together work and still feel like a whole person and like you're expressing yourself professionally. That's what we're gonna be talking about in that workshop. And so I invite, invite you guys to join in for that. But for now, I'm just kind of planting that seed that instead of there being one perfect job for you or one all-in-one full-time job, that there are going to be many opportunities that align with your skills and your sense of purpose and that you can pull these together to really feel like you're expressing yourself and having a meaningful impact through your work. Well, let me copy and paste that one into the chat. That's the third mindset. The fourth mindset is how it used to be. I'll go to work, I'll get my paycheck, and then I'll come home and live my life. And I don't think that you would be here if you believed that that was true. The reason that we're in this mission-driven work is because we believe that work is more than a necessity. It's an expression of who we are. So raise your hand if you want more from your work than a paycheck. All right, put in the chat, what do you, what do you want from your work if you want more than a paycheck? What more could it give you? Go ahead and type it in. Fulfillment, community, balance, mental stimulation, making a difference, core values, make the world better, appreciation, belonging, connection, joy, purpose, alignment with your personal mission, an outlet for creativity. Yes, May and Darcy, um, my voice to be heard, opportunity to share knowledge and conversation. Yeah. I think you're all kind of getting at this idea that, that we express ourselves through our work. We put our hearts into it, really. And so it's a way of sharing ourselves, our talents, our values. It's a way of connecting with other people. 
And it's also a way of having a meaningful impact. And this is something that's really interesting that's happened in the working world is that nonprofits are not the only place where this is happening now. Oftentimes when people think about doing meaningful work or making the world a better place, they think, oh, I got to work in nonprofits. But this sense of purpose and meaning in work is really going into other industries as well. People are catching on because the research is showing that this is what workers care about. We want to feel like our skills and our values are useful and that we are making an impact. So meaningful work does not mean um, charitable work. I like to say work that is meaningful for you because what is meaningful to you is very personal and it's different for everyone. And so really getting clear on what it is that you want to express through your work or how you make meaning through your work is a way of really tuning in to what would be the right fit. In this day and age, when so much is demanded of us in our work, we, in, we are asked to invest so much of ourselves and there's such a magnitude of time and effort and attention that we put into our work that we really need it to love us back in some ways. And so um, that sense of expressing yourself through your work is critical to how we approach it. All right, the fifth mindset. In the past, we used to put our professional identity in a job title, an industry, or a company. So if I were to, Marie, if I were to meet you at a networking event and I asked you, hey, Marie, what do you do? What would you say? Um, I would say that I am a museum educator and I work at a archival library museum in Boston. Okay. Yeah, I think actually that's what I would use. That's what I used. I would have said that in the past, but now after working with you as my career coach, I would say something different. What would you say now? Um, <laughs> I'm a mission driven um, educator in that works in museums that is dedicated to um, engaging community and bringing equity to education. Awesome. Thanks for um, being put on the spot there. Ooh, somebody's clapping for you. So, <laughs> um, Yeah, I think that when we meet new people and we're asked that very American question, what do you do? A lot of us feel obligated to um, spit out our job title and the company that we work for. So whatever it is, it's on our paycheck. That's the answer that we need to give. And um, that means that we are letting our work dictate our professional identity and letting your your identity lie with your job title or your industry is a liability many people over the past year have been laid off furloughed industries have changed and when that happens they have to have this this existential crisis like who am i if i'm not the program director at this organization I worked with a client a couple of years ago who had been the communications director at her organization where she had worked for 20 years and something came up. She lost her job and she, she didn't know where she ended and the organization began. And I think that's something that we're very good at as we embody the missions of our organizations, we can kind of lose our professional identity in it a bit. And so when we worked together, we helped her to really own her own professional identity, to talk about who she is, not based on her job title or the company where she works, but instead based on her values, her mission, um, what, she, what kind of meaningful impact she wants to have in the world. And so in that way, we need to break free of the boxes and take ownership over our own professional identities unless we uh, unless we take the lead in defining that ourselves, other people are going to define it for us. 
And I really have this belief that we need to think of ourselves as the master of our own destinies, as, as unique, and really own, um, own who we are instead of letting our job title own that for us. So that's a key in being resilient in these changing career times. So I'm gonna put that in the chat here. So here we go. Let's take a look at all of these together. And I'm curious about your thoughts. If all these things are true, bear with me while I switch screens here. Um, what about this might be exciting for you? And what about it might be scary? So go ahead and put in the chat, if it's something exciting, say exciting. And if it's something scary, say scary. Um, but if these things are true, what, what are the things that come up for you? So Sarah, what's exciting about it? What do you find exciting? So if you create your own career path, if you can move in all directions to create a portfolio of work and really express yourself and, and express meaning through your work, have a lot of different jobs that align with your skills and sense of perfect purpose and own your own professional identity. What about that sounds daunting or what about it sounds exciting? Um, to me, I left my job in museums five years ago to go to graduate school. And I found that working at a rock climbing gym and at the college I went to and later Pottery Barn with really wonderful people made a huge difference because I was so burnt out on museums after 12 years. And the thought that rock climbing and Pottery Barn could make me feel fulfilled was something I had never considered before. Like museums was my life for my, mm. since I was 13. So that was a huge realization. And that's kind of where I'm going forward now, being unemployed, working toward mixing those things together. That's awesome, Sarah. Thanks so much for sharing that. So it sounds like you were kind of on that escalator of like forward and up and you stepped off for a bit, like needed to shake things up, regroup, do something a little different, get in some new communities, move your body a little bit. Um, and, and that that was really refreshing. And so those are just chapters in your career. Um, I love it. So let's see what else has come in here. Um, exciting. It's limitless. There are two sides of that coin for sure, Emma. It's like, oh, I can do anything. Oh, God, I can do anything. <laughs> Where do I even begin? Um, all right, Christina says, I'm, I'm a military spouse. So this allows me to view my crazy career path and seem not so much a disadvantage as a true advantage. Yeah, totally. I think that actually having this portfolio of work means that you, you have more to fall back on. Like Sarah, you might be unemployed right now and looking for opportunities, but you have a, a wider variety of things that you could be looking at than if you were just looking for a collections pos position, right? Um, and so having these different chapters in your career path means that there's a variety and a lot that you can fall back on. Um, Elaine says, yeah, I'm versatile, can succeed in different lines of work. Ali says, getting to do more of what I love. It's scary losing the security and potentially having to do my own HR bookkeeper marketing. Yes, I think we're going to be talking about that more in that other session that I'm going to be leading with Tyler. Um, so definitely check that out because it is not without its challenges to piece together things and be your own boss. Um, but I think there are ways to think about security and stability within that. Um, what, I've, what I've always wanted, but also frightening and not always knowing where the next step will fall. Mia, that is the perfect segue. Um, with no direction but my own, what if I fail? Um, yes. Okay, so let's talk about how you actually do this because it is quite exciting to have this freedom, but it is overwhelming. And where do you even begin? And the way that I think about it is 
if, if this is the career terrain in front of us and there are so many options and we are in our Jeep, we're in the driver's seat, in the back seat, we've got all the skills and experience and our values that we're gonna take with us no matter where we go. How do we know that we should take this road over that road? And for me, that all comes down to your navigation system. And so that's what I call this idea of the strategic career compass. Now, as I told you, I came up through nonprofits and one of my roles at the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities was to really manage the implementation of our strategic plan. And so I was like deep into our strategic plan, our vision, our goals, um, our mission and our values as an organization. And I started to think about what it would mean to have a strategic plan for myself. And so that's how this tool got started. And the reason why I call it a compass and not a plan is because it doesn't tell you how to get to any certain destination, but it does help you to make each decision as you move along the way so that no matter where you end up, it's somewhere that you want to be. And so creating your own strategic career compass means going deeper than your job title and your industry and thinking about your mission, the sense of, of purpose that drives you, what kind of impact you want to have, your vision. And so for me, a vision is not a plan. It's not, this is the exact destination. This is my five-year plan, because I think we all know that that's going to get thrown right out the window because things are going to change. Opportunities are going to come up. Changes are going to happen that you had no way of predicting. But it is worth thinking about what would be exciting for you in the future. Because if you get into that, all those little tidbits are like breadcrumbs and clues. And so if you break it down into all the little pieces, like the kind of work environment you want to be in, the kinds of projects you want to work on, what you want your coworkers to look like, what you want to wear to work and what you want your office to look like. All of those are like these parameters that you can keep in mind so that as you make decisions along the way, you can say to yourself, well, does this move me closer to my vision or away from my vision? Your core values, those are like the heart of the compass. That's where everything begins. Those are the principles that are most important to you and they, whether you know it or not, they drive the decisions you make, um, whether you feel like you're in a rut or in a groove, um, how your relationships are going at work, how, how fulfilled you feel through your work. And so that is a key piece of information about whether this path would fit over that path. Your toolbox, which is your set of skills and strengths that you bring to the table and your unique leadership style, whether you have formal leadership authority or if you are leading through influence. If you came to my session at the NEMA conference last fall, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and then your definition of success. That is such a huge one because I don't know about you guys, but in my head, my definition of success was climbing that ladder, like get, climb up, forward and up as fast as possible, which is what I did within my organization. And when I got to the role of associate director, it did not feel like I expected it to feel. Um, I didn't feel good. And that was because I was living someone else's definition of success and didn't take the time to really think about what authentically feels fulfilling to me. And so when I work with clients, we go through and we define each of these things. And these really make up your professional identity so that you're not relying on your job title or your industry to say who it is that you are and what you do. Um, but rather this deeper sense of the professional drive that you bring to the table and what you stand for. So I want to take a look at what that actually looks like for people. Let me see. I'm just going to look over the chat here to make sure. Um, Mia said something. It can also be worrying when you know that there's so much discussion of this right now and so many people are moving towards things like consulting or independent work. You get this sense that that area might become flooded. Yes, other people are saying yes to that. And again, I'm, I definitely wanna tackle that in the session that I'm gonna do with my friend Tyler in a few weeks. All right, so I wanna tell you about two people I've worked with. The first person is um, a collections manager. 
So she's a collections manager at a museum and we wanted to dive deeper into her professional identity than just relying on describing herself as a collections manager. So here's a snapshot of what this looks like. Her core values are grit, collaboration, and curiosity. And her mission that she articulated is to activate objects through co-creation and storytelling so that they spark curiosity, empathy, and wonder. So notice that she didn't say museum or collections <laughs> anywhere in her mission. And that's because I challenged her to go deeper than that and to describe what drives her to do what she does. So I want us to pretend right now that we're her, her work bestie. And I want us to brainstorm some other jobs outside of museums in other industries where this could be um, relevant and compelling. Where might she find some other opportunities for work given that um, she comes to it with this sense of drive and values? Podcasts, branding, photography, game design, merchandising, marketing, advertising, librarian, yeah, theater, writing, teaching, archivist, toys like Lego. Ooh, I love that idea, Sarah. Um, documentary film. Yeah, the storytelling piece of it is definitely coming through there. Yeah, so when she came to me, it was like, she's been doing this for a long time. She's been a collections manager and at her particular institution for a long time too. And so she felt like, I'm not even sure I know who I am personally because I am just embodying this title in this organization. And so if she ever had to or wanted to shift directions, she didn't feel like she was, um, strong enough or nimble enough or ha had a sense of how to even talk about her skills and what she brings to the table in a way that could connect to other opportunities. But breaking down what, what drives her and thinking about that instead of her job title enabled us to, to really get to the heart of why she does what she does. And as you guys can see, there are some other areas where she could take this skill set and this um, this approach to her work and really have a meaningful impact. Here's another example. So this is someone who um, was, she, she, um, she wrote uh, labels for, please somebody tell me what that is. <laughs> what is that called? When you're writing exhibit labels and really focused on the content um, yes, interpretation. Thank you. Um, yes, so she's a, an exhibit interpreter, museum interpreter. And, um, and so she wanted to feel more adaptable, more think about how she could take her work into some different areas as well. So her core values are teamwork, action, and creativity. And her mission is to find innovative ways to make complex content accessible and engaging to a broad audience in order to inspire learning, action, and positive change. So let's be her bestie for a minute and think about how we might, or what are some areas where we might advise her to look for some job opportunities outside of um, the traditional positions that she's been in. Marketing and branding, design, corporate education, theater education, community engagement, activism and social work, special educator, app developer, textbook writing. Yes, what an amazing skill set, right? For To like synthesize information and make it accessible. I mean, tell me a line of work that doesn't need that really. Um, in her case, she thought about what causes um, excite her the most and um, environmental causes are a big part of, of what's in her heart. And so she was looking into um, positions at environmental nonprofits and advocacy organizations and policy work. Yes, totally, it's coming up here. Um, and even some um, government organizations like um, the Department of Environmental Management, 
Um, and so she was thinking about how she could really bring that skill set and that passion for, um, for inspiring people to take action and educating them to take action. Very cool. I want to show you another example of sort of a before and after of a client who thought about her career in those more traditional terms or in those old rules and then shifted the, her way of thinking. So when she came to me, this is like a mock-up of a fake, her fake LinkedIn account. Um, she was a program associate at a philanthropic foundation, a large family foundation. And so this is what her LinkedIn profile looked like. Her headline was program associate at that nonprofit. And her little about section, her professional summary said, very traditional things that you would read there. So she's a philanthropy professional with five plus years of experience in this certain area, demonstrated success in admission and administration of grant processes from prospects to RFPs, data tracking, reporting. She's a proven team player with strong communication skills. Nothing wrong with that. It's fine, right? We're, it's uh, well said. The problem was when she came to work with me, she wasn't necessarily interested in continuing that upward. Well, she was told at her organization that there was no room for her to grow there, essentially. And so she started to ask herself, well, what do I really want to be doing? Is it something at another philanthropic institution? Do I want to head to something different? And so we, we dove deeper into what makes her tick. And for her, it's really all about educational equity. That was the common thread for her. So it didn't matter if she was working in philanthropy. What mattered was that she was using data and administration to support efforts towards educational equity. And so when she started looking for a new position, she was looking in um, the public sector, in school districts and um, education policy organizations. She was looking into think tanks and um, lobbying or advocacy organizations. She was looking into nonprofits and also um, for-profit like education technology companies. And so the way that she reshaped her profile is this. Her uh, title, her headline, instead of being her job title and her organization, was more about who she is as a professional. So again, she took control of her own professional identity rather than letting it rest in her job title and organization. So it says, passionate education professional committed to advancing equity in education. And that was gonna be true for her no matter what type of organization she ended up in. Here she talks in her about section about her mission. So what she, what she wants, the kind of impact she wants to have in her organization through her work, um, how are the skills that she's most interested in using, data and processes to uh, analysis to strategically help us ar ar arrive at solutions um, and drive improvements. And then she talks too about the more kind of values-based part of her identity about being intrepid, adapting to change, inclusivity, building community towards a common vision. Um, and so she really tied together this, this whole new sense of who she is as a professional that's not, it wasn't based on, here's my title, here's my job, here's what I have done. It was more saying, here's what drives me, here's my skill set, and here's where I want to take it in the future. So I'm curious, what do you guys think of this? What are your reactions, ahas, questions? about taking this new approach to um, presenting yourself as a professional. Feel free to type in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, you can do that. Mia says, I know I can be scared sometimes not that, that not putting forward more traditionally concrete answers and descriptors will fail to convince or sound cohesive or formal enough for potential employers to know what to make of me. Take notice. Um, yeah, nice and all, but um, yeah. So I think it is really important that you get your story straight. And I say story because this 
isn't a list of facts about what Jane has done in the past, which is how some people think of their LinkedIn profile or their resume to say, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. It's a story that she's telling about who she is. And so she's really taking control over this story and she is putting it in this cohesive package that is really focused, but also very adaptable, right? Because she could work in all of these different contexts, but use the same skills and with the same purpose. Um, and what she really needs to do is connect the dots for the employer. So say she was looking to apply for a position at, um, at an education technology company and her, her resume says philanthropy, philanthropy, philanthropy. She needs to tell the story of this is how what I've done really connects to what you're doing. Instead of just hoping that the hiring manager is going to read between the lines and put the story together for themselves. So Mia, that's a really important aspect to think through the story. And it's that's deep work. It doesn't happen in, you know, five minutes of sitting in front of a resume. It takes reflection. It takes going deeper and it takes time. Um, Jen asks, do you have thoughts about skills-based resumes versus traditional resumes when thinking of your professional experience more as a portfolio rather than a list of jobs? Um, gosh, skills-based resumes. I can't say. I, I mean, I think people really like more traditional resumes. I love one that, that calls out your skills um, so you can see uh, what I like to see is is a summary or the skills at the top because it really frames the story that you're going to tell. So all the job experience underneath is like your evidence that supports the story that you're telling about who you are as a professional. Um, and so I don't know if I have a very clear answer on that. It probably depends on the industry that you're applying for as well and how normal or weird it is to put forward a different looking resume because certainly different resumes work in different um, industries. Do you divide this type of language when you write on a resume on LinkedIn? I agree on the idea that you're telling your own story, but when applying, do you do a CV and cover letter? Um, yeah, so you might be telling the story in the cover letter. Um, you might have the opportunity to tell a bit of your story in the resume just by including um, a couple sentences at the top that's a professional summary. And that's where I like to say kind of who I am, what I stand for, um, or call out those key skills that I wanna bring forward. Um, I found it exhausting and limiting to shape myself into available jobs instead of setting the expectations of what I can bring to a position. This is really liberating. Yes, yes, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I, it really changes the dynamic from, okay, what does this job want me to be? How can I make myself sound like that? And then going into the interview and saying, I hope I say what they wanna hear. I hope they pick me. Um, instead, this is saying, here's who I am. Here's what I stand for. Here's what I bring to the table. And because I'm clear on that, I can see how it connects with what you're doing here. And I wanna see if this is a good match. It's a totally different energy to bring into one of those opportunities. Um, LJ says, the first concern that comes to mind is that while this reformat is great, there are so many other things that go into a job search. Your resume, cover letter, interview skills, and frankly, a ton of luck and privilege. Yeah, social connections is huge. Um, how do you know if this actually has an impact that makes it worth the time? I think what it, the difference that I see, LJ, is in how people feel about themselves in the job search. And all of these new mindsets aren't about like, here's how you have to change in order to survive in this world. It's more about, here's how you can take back some of the control. Here's how you can own it for yourself and feel more proactive versus reactive as you're navigating all of this. And how you can make clear decisions about, okay, I'm interested in this and not in that because I understand who I am and I have an actual set of criteria to hold up an opportunity next to. Um, so I think LJ, I'd say it, it really changes the way that you feel when you're approaching opportunities 
versus um, it's a way of playing the game. I'm curious, um, Marie, if you would have anything to say about that, given the fact that, that you've thought about this yourself and we've worked together. I don't wanna put you on the spot if you don't have. Just to process it a bit better, can you pose the full question for me? It's just easier that way. Sure. Let me <laughs> think about it. It's <laughs> me with my process when I yeah. think so and then I'll put on the spot. Um, how, how do you know if the, taking this approach actually has an impact that makes it worth all the time of like reflecting on all this stuff about yourself, reshaping your story about, about who you are as a professional? How do you know that that do, was worth it? How do, how do I know that it, it's, it's, it works to reflect and to, to kind of go through that instead? Just be, yeah, to, to think about your professional identity in these terms rather than the resume that you had before or the trajectory, the way you were thinking of it before? It's much more helpful because it gives me a, a clearer sense of what my direction is. It, it makes me feel more aligned with, um, instead of, I think you already talked about this, and so I'm sorry if I'm being redundant, but instead of you know, looking to fit in with organizations, I'm looking for organizations that fit me. You know, it's, it's a long-term investment because I know that I'm setting myself up for my own personal success, my definition of success. So yeah, I think shifting that might feel scary. And I noticed some of you in the chat might have um, mentioned that, but and you're afraid that it might not look traditional enough and you know it won't be taken, interpreted the same way as traditional resumes with certain language and things you're supposed to list. But I think it's actually better and it actually can grab the attention of the right people that respect, you know, who you are and what you can offer to their organization or in collaborating with them. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Marie. I think mm -hmm. Elsie also said that, you know, looking for a job is so exhausting. It's true. And, and it's, it takes so much mental energy. Um, and I mean, applying, putting together a resume and cover letter is, it's a lot. And I think, um, I think that having this, this clear sense of, of a filter to put things through or to understand how to manage your energy in a job search, to not just apply to everything because you're afraid that, that you know, any one of these is the lifeboat that's passing you by and you got to grab it versus saying, you know what, I'm going to focus on these three opportunities rather than all these other ones because I know that these are a better fit. Um, so it could be the case that it gives you a stronger filter to manage your energy better and to feel like you're being more proactive versus reactive. But to be sure, you know, being in a job search is exhausting and it requires a lot of self-compassion and self-care and support. Um, Let's see. Can I add one quick thing? Yeah. I also think it, it bulks up your confidence when you flip it. And it that that in itself really, I think, attracts more employers. It just, you know, and not only in your materials, that really comes through in your interview. You're really sure of yourself. You're really sure of what you're going to bring to that role that's unique. Um, so that's just one more thing I wanted to add. Mm, thanks, Marie. Yeah, so we have a few minutes left and I want to make sure that I'm leaving you with something concrete that you can really take with you. So what I'm going to give you is, um, is an activity to actually get your values out of your head and your heart and define them so that you can consciously use them as, um, as a tool to help you make decisions, to understand um, what feels right and what rubs up against you and is not a good fit. Your values are like a set of glass, tinted glasses through which you see the world and you are uniquely tuned into the things that are, um, that are most important to you. And so these are, these are things that you operate by whether you know it or not. And becoming aware of them, really naming them, getting them out on paper means that you can really use them as a tool to understand when you're feeling off track, to ground yourself, to remind yourself of why you do what you do, and to have the language to talk about yourself with clarity. So for instance, one of my clients, she was in an interview and they asked her, what's your five-year plan? 
um, which is such a stupid question. And, and she said, well, I can't tell you exactly what I'm going to be doing in five years, but I can tell you that my core values are social justice, equity, and creativity. And no matter what it is that I'm doing, it's going to be um, it's going to be related to those causes. And she felt like she had, um, she felt really proud of that answer and that, that she was able to articulate herself clearly and say something that felt true and not just what they wanted to hear. So I wanna give you the opportunity to, to dive into your values. Here are your next steps after this session. So the first one is to really practice these new mindsets. Just try them on like you would try on a sweater um, because this is some new ways of thinking about navigating your career. And some of them might feel natural. Some of them might feel a little itchy or that they don't fit quite right. And so you might need to kind of think about, you know, how it fits for you. Um, and so if you want to have some support in practicing these new mindsets, I put out a newsletter twice a month where I write articles and share resources that really reinforce, uh, well, not reinforce, but give you ways of thinking about how to really apply these in your life. And so if you're interested in subscribing to that, I just put the link to that into the chat box. I'm going to share with you the uh, document to, um, to name your core values. I just have to get it to hop into the chat here. Bear with me. Um, and then the third thing is that workshop that I mentioned. It's going to be on March 10th, and it's about resilient career navigation for underemployed arts and culture professionals. Um, and so I really want to make sure that we are giving people some great tools for that. Um, let me see if this is working. Um, I think I'm going to email the, uh, the handout out, but I'm going to give you a preview of what it looks like right now so that I can make sure you have a sense of what, how you're going to dive into your, um, your values. So I'm gonna pull it up here. Here's what it looks like. It's a big, big page of lots of words. So I'm gonna have you go through and circle every single word that resonates with you. And then you're gonna go back and you're going to narrow it down to just three words. And the way that you do this is oftentimes there's some clusters of like words that are kind of in a family together. And so maybe you look at those together and you say, you know what, it's really all about balance or you know what is the word that's kind of the umbrella around all of those and then you're going to write your words on the next page and write down your definition of what they mean to you and then i've included this printout here that you can print out you can write your words on each of these bubbles and put it up in a place where you can see it so i always have my values right here over my desk and they're there so I can remind myself of why I do what I do. If I'm like, what is happening? What is this even all about? Or I have to remind myself of who I am. They're right there for me to ground me and guide me um, as I move forward. So this will be coming out to you and I'd love to hear what comes up for you as you do it. I hope that you guys could maybe pair off and um, hold each other accountable to doing the together because I know it's really tempting to come to something like this and say, oh yeah, I'm totally going to do that. And then tomorrow, you know, you're off and doing some other thing, but this is an investment in yourself and it's going to help you whether you're changing careers or whether you want to engage more deeply where you are. And so I really encourage you to take that tool, find somebody to do it with um, and share, uh, share ideas, bounce, bounce it off of each other. Um, yeah, I tried to upload the file, but, um, you know, I can do it now if you hold on for one second. Um, but if anyone has any questions while I do this, go ahead, pop it into the chat. Or Caroline, we can also just link it on the NEMA website too, if you want to email me. Okay. Yeah, oh, we'll that's that easy. Yeah. We'll do that too, but I'll put it up here just okay. so that, um, people can grab it. All right. So thank you so much. Um, I think Marie was like putting in a bunch of links to my stuff while I was talking. So I hope that you'll connect with me um, 
and that uh, I can find some other ways to support you as you guys navigate your careers um, and share your gifts and your sense of purpose with the world. Thanks so much for joining us. And thanks to Nima and the Yeps for having me. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you. <laughs> pleasure um yeps we have another event coming up next month in march lisa or emma do you know the exact date off the top of your heads we haven't confirmed it yet but we're hoping for march 18th yeah keep a keep your eyes peeled for that in via uh nema emails um just sign up on uh, look on the nema website if you don't get emails or if you want to get emails and i put all of carol Ann's stuff a bunch of times in the chat here so Follow her on Instagram, um, Penny Leadership. Find her on LinkedIn, and we put her website in. Just Google Carol Ann Penny. She's amazing, and I'm so glad I found her as a career coach. She's mm -hmm. really amazing resource. So thank you, Carol Ann. Thanks, Marie. Mia had a question. Marie, did you want to answer that? <laughs> Oh, what was the question? Uh, the pack chairs had mentioned monthly meetings. I dropped out a bit after the conference because of family issues. So I'd love to know if there are routine meetings I'm unaware of. That's a good question. Yeah, so we are gonna be having monthly events. Um, some of our events are going to be coffee and commiser commiseration <laughs> events. So it's just kind of like us yeps getting together and talking about some guided um, subjects. We'll send out resources in advance. Um, well, we can tell you quickly a little bit about our next one coming up in March. We also have um, PAG Adventures where we introduce you to different PAG groups because just because you're in our PAG doesn't mean you can be in other PAGs. There's Education PAG, there's um, there's all different, just go on the NEMA website. Um, I, that was sad, I just listed one. Um, there's a, a new LGBTQ. Uh, I think Marie just went out a little bit, but yes, we do have a new PAG chair. Um, PAG, definitely check our website. Um, it has all of our PAG information and along with contact information. Yeah, do- um, Charlotte also just posted in the chat. Yeah, yep. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, um, as Marie was saying before we lost her, um, we do have a, a different event every month and we do try to have a variety um, so that we can kind of keep everyone interested because uh, as Carol Ann said, we're, we're not all seeking to be the executive directors, right? We, we all have different interests, different skill sets. Um, and so we really want to be sure that we're bringing that to all of you. Um, so if you ever have ideas, if there's something you'd like for us to uh, explore, let us know, email us. Um, I think, I don't know if Marie can, but uh, Emma and I will quickly drop our emails in the chat, um, or you can also find us on the Nemo website. Awesome. But thank Thanks, you guys. all for joining us. Thanks, everybody. And thank you so much, Carol Ann and Heather and Scarlett. This is awesome. <laughs> Thanks for seeing all your faces. <laughs> Thanks.